Cheers and salutations. Welcome one and all to Americans Learn. And today, we have ourselves a fun video to check out. It is from the Fat Electrician and is titled America's Warhorse Marine. You know the saying, M A R I N E S. That's the way you spell success. Sergeant Reckless. Now, I've never heard of this story, but I've been seeing in the comment section below and from requests that many of you have been asking us to check this video out. So, as always, let's get our learn on. But before we get started, as I believe in getting our learn on, please support the original content creator. It's the right thing to do. The original link is in the description box below. So please, 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 before you forget to do anything else, support the original content creator. I expect all you hip cool cats to do that. So without further ado, since I'm in charge of the ones and twos, and since all of you are doing so well, thank you so much for hitting that subscribe button or hitting that like button. It does help us out. We also have some great links in the description box below. But until then, let's get ready to play this video in a three, a two, a one. What if I told you that if it were not for the actions of a single beer drinking horse over the course of What if I told you that if it were not for the actions of a single beer drinking horse over the course of 48 hours, South Korea as we know it today would probably not exist. Today we're talking about the greatest war horse of all time, the highest ranking animal in Marine Corps history, and the hero of Al well, I never heard about this. I mean, I know that there are dogs that are honorary or that are made into Marines, but I never heard of a horse Marine. What's going on? Post Vegas, ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Reckless. Right. Yeah. Oh. All right, before we get too far in this video, we do have a sponsor for a couple of reasons. One, I got bills, just gonna be honest with you. Two, yep. I gotta pay True. the editor. And three, in the case of this particular yep. video, Back in the day, it used to be a rule that whenever Sergeant Reckless did any type of publicity, whoever did it had to make a $1,000 donation to a Marine Corps charity, and I am going to honor that since I'm making this video about her. That being said, this video is brought to you by Raid VPN. Wait, no. Nord Shadow Legends. No. Nope. Nord VPN, that's the one. There Full disclosure, I tried to make a funny skit ad for this video where, like, me and my wife were both in bed, oh, and right, instead of using Nord a VPN. condom, I used Nord VPN. <laughs> She's like, what? VPN, and then I accidentally put a condom on my phone, but my skit failed miserably. Okay, get out of here, Mushu. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> if I used NordVPN, my dog wouldn't have been able to find me because I'd be in Singapore, actually. <laughs> <laughs> NordVPN. Your dog can find you, but your internet service provider can. <gasps> No, that's probably the best. That's probably the best commercial for NordVPN I've ever seen. The best thing ever. Okay, so believe it or not, I actually do use NordVPN in real life, but I use it for a different reason than any other talking point you've ever heard in a Nord ad ever. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you guys that today. All right, so let's say I want to start working on a new video. So I hop over to Google to find some sources. We pull up Google and let's see what we come up with. Let's say I want to do a video on Imo Koivunen, the Finnish guy that took a bunch of Pervidin. Google that. Here's what pops up. I've got a Wikipedia page okay. and then a bunch of websites that just regurgitate the same article over and over and over again. Now, okay. I know that Imo is from Finland, so if I hop over to NordVPN mm -hmm. and I actually change my location from America to Finland. to Finland. Hopefully, since it's his native language, it'll give me some better sources. Two seconds later, I'm now connected to Finland. And okay. as far as anybody on the internet is concerned, I am a Finnish guy in Finland browsing the web. As now, you should be. we just go back and I hit refresh. And as you can see, I have a bunch of different sources all about Imo Koivunen. So we're just going to pick one. Then I go up here, I hit translate. And now I have a new source of information for my video on Imo that I never would have been able to find were it not for NordVPN. And it has a bunch of other use cases on top of that so if you wanted to check it out for yourself you can go to nordvpn.com backslash the fat electrician now let's get back to this video our story takes place during Dundee. the Korean War, which is kind of an issue because most people know absolutely nothing about the Korean War, and it's kind of important for context. So we're going to do a real quick and dirty oversimplification of the entire thing. Super casual 60 seconds. We're going to learn more about the Korean War than most people do in their entire K-12 education. Go ahead and start the timer. Here we go. July 25th, 1950. Communist North Korea, backed by Communist China and the Soviet Union, decides that they are going to attack South Korea and try to take over the entire peninsula. Over the okay. course of the next five to six weeks, they would almost accomplish their 
their goal, beating the South Korean Jeez. military all the way to the base of the peninsula, and it is not looking good. But luckily, NATO shows up at the last minute to save the day. The NATO forces are like 90% American, but there's also some British, some Canadian, some Australian, and like 12 other countries on. Let's see, who else we got? We got the Republic of Korea, the Netherlands, Australia, New Zealand. That's right, better than the original Zealand. We got Belgium, we got the Philippines, we got Canada. Hey, Canada, your flag looks different. South Africa, we got Colombia. All right, gotta love that Colombia. We got Thailand, we got Ethiopia, we got Turkey, we got France, we got the United Kingdom, we got Greece, we got the United States, Luxembourg, and Japan. Okay, hey, we got, we got all those people there. On top of that, and they have a huge amphibious landing in Incheon, and they proceed to turn the tables on the North Koreans entirely, beating them all the way back into North Korea, and then they continue to advance, beating them all the way up the peninsula and almost to the border of China. So now the Chinese no. government's kind of shit in their pants because NATO's like 30 miles off their border, and they can't have NATO coming up in their territory with their their democracy and their human rights and their food. They've got to do something about this. So China comes out of left field with their big ass military, joins the fight, takes NATO completely by surprise, beats them all the way back down the peninsula to pretty much the original North and South Korean border. And this is where our story begins. I'm not trying to brag, but that was under 60 seconds and I got a Lord of the Rings reference in there. I'm having Great. a really good day. Okay, now that we're on- It would have been better if it was Warhammer though. On the same page, October 1952, here's what the front line looks like. Each one of those triangles represents a hill, and on top of those hills is a bunch of NATO troops. Basically, at this point in time, NATO is now just trying to hold this line long enough to force the communists to sign a peace treaty and preserve South Korea. Because, as it turns out, this long string of hills is almost the exact same border that South Korea was before. So, if they can utilize these hills to hold the high ground, maybe they can get this accomplished. Why do they want to hold the high ground? Well, because the high ground's awesome, isn't it, Anakin? <laughs> yeah, anyways, if I could the devil on the high ground, the high ground's good to have. Bring your attention to the furthest triangle on the left where it says the Nevada cities. That is not actually okay. one hill, but three smaller hills in a close triangular formation. Let's see, we got hold on, hold on, hold on. Cities that is not actually one hill, but three smaller hills. We got Reno, we got Carson, we got Elko, we got Vegas, and Berlin. Oh, wow, hey, there's Detroit over there and East Berlin as well. Okay. Not too bad. In a close triangular formation, commonly referred to as the Iron Triangle. Each one of these hills is named after one of the three Nevada gambling cities, Reno, Carson, and Vegas. The reason that NATO named them after the Nevada gambling cities is because it is a gamble as to whether or not the Marine Corps is going to be able to hold that position. Because if- How dare you? Yes, the Marine Corps will hold. Chinese communist forces are going to try to break through this line. It's probably going to be right there at the Nevada cities because then they will have a direct path to the capital of Seoul. And if they're able to capture Seoul, it'll be absolutely devastating to NATO's ability to negotiate a peace treaty. So the United States Marine Corps absolutely has to hold this position. And most importantly, they have to hold outpost Vegas because it is the highest of the three hills. And if they lose Vegas, they are almost guaranteed to lose the other two. All right, so here's the plan. Each one of these hills is going to have 40 Marines and two Navy corpsmen on top. These hills are so steep that the only way to get up there is by foot they're like a 45 degree angle all the way up so the marines aren't able to get trucks up there they're not able to get tanks up there the only thing they can get up there is barbed wire shovels for digging trenches okay. guns and 75 millimeter recoilless rifles okay. these recoilless rifles are pretty much going to be the marines only chance of defending themselves if they do get attacked the problem with it is though since you can't get a truck up on this hill now the marines have to carry all the ammunition up themselves and each shell weighs approximately 24 pounds so because carrying these shells up this enormous hill one or we call carrying those shells in the Marine Corps Tuesday. Two at a time absolutely sucks. The Marines get permission to buy a horse or a mule or a donkey or something. So they go down to Seoul and they start looking. And obviously the first place they choose to investigate is the horse race track at Seoul. Is there probably going to be a pack animal at a race track for sale? No. No, probably not because no. that's race horses and race horses don't make good pack animals. But that is the one place that's going to have alcohol and gambling. So yeah. you best believe that's where the Marines are going to check first. But as fate would have it. You would think I would feel oddly attacked by that. But no, that is a scientific fact. Gambling, alcohol, women, a whole lot of good time there. Of course, of course, of course we're going to check it out first. And we're not doing it just because for fun. Would you believe that it's all about science? Don't give me that look. It's for science. Okay, science, science. 
and I and I will not be challenged in the comments section below. They would meet up with a horse trainer and jockey by the name of Kim Hook Moon, who would be willing to reluctantly sell his horse a uh, chim high which translates to flame in the morning he absolutely did not want to sell this horse he described it as the most beautiful and intelligent horse on the planet yep but he did it for 250 dollars because he had to buy his sister a prosthetic leg i believe her name was peggy or was it eileen <laughs> anyways the marines buy this horse they throw her in a trailer they take her back to camp from there she immediately goes into what the marines call hoof camp get it hoof camp boot camp that's funny. Moving on. The first thing they do is try to get the horse acclimated to battle by firing the recoilless rifle near her. And the first time they fired this rifle, this horse jumped four feet straight into the air and freaked the fuck out. Then they calmed her down. They fired it again. Still scared out of her mind. And they fired it again and again. And by the eighth time they fired it, she was completely calm and a recoilless rifle never scared her ever again. From there, they taught her how to survive. She learned how to avoid barbed wire. She learned not to get too close to the back end of the recoilless rifles because the blowback could hurt her. She yeah. learned that whenever a Marine yelled incoming, she needed to run to a nearby bunker or if she wasn't near a bunker, she learned how to lay down. After she completed her training, the Marines ordered her a special saddle to be made and shipped all the way from America that would allow her to carry a bunch of recoilless rifle rounds. Until then, though, she began helping the Marines any way she could, mainly by helping string communications cable between the different outposts and the ammunition point. And she could string more cable than 10 men combined. At this That's right. That's right. She knows how to get it done. Look out, Kathleen Kennedy. We got a horse that could be a real protagonist in a, in a movie. <laughs> At this point, the Marines really, really started to like this horse, so they decided they were going to give her a new name, Reckless, named after the recoilless rifles, which were commonly referred to as Reckless Rifles. And from that point on, she just became another one of the guys, and that's, that's exactly right. how the Marines started treating her. She began eating whatever the Marines were eating. She loved bacon and eggs. She loved beer. And apparently, if you were ever having mixed drinks, Reckless would walk up to you, nudge you with her head, and stick out her lower lip, and let you mix a mixed drink directly into her mouth. Then her special saddle shows up. That's that is that is just incredible. See, that's that's how we get things done through science, cultural understanding, education, and diplomacy. That's what we're taught in the Marines. <laughs> I couldn't keep a straight face, but it's true up and she starts kicking ass on the battlefield she delivers six rounds at a time and she can make a trip from the ammo point to the firing position twice as fast as any man can and he's only carrying two rounds she delivers so much ammo that over the course of a couple battles the chinese actually start to target reckless and this ends up being a horrific mistake because the millisecond that marine corps leadership figures out that they're trying to target reckless they flip the script turn around to the marines and they're like boys they're trying to kill Reckless so they can eat her because they're starving communists. At which point, all the Marines responded with... Okay, the Marines are absolutely... Remember when I said I'd kill you last? I lied. Absolutely furious. This is worse than fucking with Doc. We've got multiple Docs. We've only got one Reckless. We can't allow this to happen. Right. And the Marines begin fighting that much harder. And they have more ammo to fight even harder with because Reckless is right there with them bearing ammo the entire time. From this point on, they begin dominating every skirmish that they take part in. As At one should. point, they're working adjacent to the Australian military and the Australians are so blown away by Reckless that they come up to meet her after the skirmish and they actually give her one of their campaign hats as a reward for being such a badass on the battlefield. Good. Reckless and the Marines Correct. fight and hold the line for the next five months, and by March of 1953, peace talks between North and South Korea are well underway, and it's beginning to finally look like this war might come to a peaceful resolution. But right. on March 26th, the Chinese forces would launch a major offensive trying to break through the line at the Nevada cities with 4,000 men. For the next four days, the Marine Corps and the Chinese fight over these hills. The Chinese take the hill, the Marines take it back, the Chinese take the hill, the Marines, Marines take, take it, it back. back. Eventually, it got to the point where nobody could hold the top of the hill and you just had the Chinese on one slope of the hill and the Marines on the other. They said that there was so much artillery flying in both directions for the entirety of four days that the sound of individual explosions gave way to what seemed like a constant and consistent roar. For four days, they were completely unable to verbally communicate and they could only talk to each other via hand signals. And because of all this noise, the Marine Corps forward observers weren't able to effectively communicate with the Marine Corps artillery and mortars, meaning that the artillery and mortars 
mortars were just firing blindly into the general vicinity of where the enemy should be. Meaning that the only effective fire the Marine Corps has in this fight is coming from the recoilless rifles because they don't require a forward observer and they don't require communication. Right. The men with the recoilless rifles are the ones spotting the enemy and firing the gun. The recoilless rifles are now the key to winning this battle and That's they right. absolutely have to stay up and get running it. and they have to get this ammunition up to these hills to fight back. Go. The problem is the ammo point is 750 yards away from the firing position up a 45 degree angle hill that is constantly being pounded with enemy artillery fire while it's also covered with smoke and white phosphorus. But that doesn't change the fact that the ammunition has to get there. So they load eight rounds into Reckless's pack and they send her up the hill. And the men at the ammunition depot know that it's probably the last time they're ever gonna see her again because they've just sent her off to her death. But despite that, she somehow makes it to the firing position. The Marines there unload the ammo and stick a wounded Marine on her back as they send her back down the hill also feeling as though they're sending her to her death and it's the last time they're ever going to see their favorite horse. But they're wrong over and over and over again. They're wrong. That's right. Why? Because Sergeant Reckless is a Marine. M-A-R-I-N-E-S. That's the way you spell success. Because every 20 minutes like clockwork, Reckless is back at the firing position, bringing more ammunition, and then she's back at the ammunition depot, dropping off wounded Marines. And she does this all day long, and with every trip she makes, she becomes less and less of a horse, and more and more the only sign of hope that these men have. Because of this little horse that's quite literally an animal of prey, whose only defensive measure to danger is to run away, can stand here and fight through all of this, then <laughs> fuck maybe they can too. Despite being struck by shrapnel twice, Reckless kept the Marines so well stocked with ammunition that they managed to melt one of the barrels of the 75 millimeter recoilless rifles. On the first day of battle alone, she made 51 round trips to the firing line, covering over 35 miles, delivering 386 rounds of ammunition, totaling over 9,000 pounds, and that's not including all the Marines that she carried back down the hill. At the end of the first day of battle, they took Reckless, gave her all the food and water that she would eat or drink, and then they laid her down to bed. She got to sleep for six six hours before the first enemy artillery shell impacted and at that she was back up and ready to do it all over again and she repeated her performance from the day prior at the end of the second day nobody held outpost vegas at the top of the hill the chinese held one slope and the marines held the other and it is at this point that the marine corps leadership decided that if they can't hold the high ground there just isn't going to be a high ground anymore they called in the marine air wing and on the morning of the third day of battle the marine corps dropped 28 tons That's of ordnance right. on top of the hill completely leveling every defensive structure and anything else that was up there. By the end of the third day, the Marines had taken the top of the hill where Outpost Vegas used to be, but then they saw that the Chinese were falling back into a ravine and they were going to go around the hill entirely. This is absolutely terrible because there aren't enough Marines on Outpost Vegas, Carson, and Reno combined to be able to go down there and stop the Chinese. If they're going to stand any chance in a fight, they have to have the high ground, so they absolutely cannot give it up. The problem is, on the back side of the hill that Outpost Vegas is on is where the ammunition depot is, as well as a mess tent that's been converted into an aid station with over 200 wounded Marines, and there's nothing that the Marines on top of the outpost can do to stop. First of all, great narration from the Fat Electrician. This is phenomenal storytelling 101. I'm at the edge of my seat. I've never heard of this story before. So, hey. Shout out to all the brave Marines and all the servicemen who serve there. But my goodness gracious, talk about a story to tell. Them. Then the Marines at Outpost Carson get an idea and they send a runner with a note to the aid station as fast as they can. He gives a note to the commander of the aid station who then tries to read the note to all 200 wounded Marines but the artillery fire is so loud that he can't be heard. So he resorts to just handing the note to one Marine who hands it to the next and the next and the next. And after reading the note, every Marine hangs his head for a second and gets on his feet because the note reads, Chinese coming around the hill, dropping smoke, walk out into the smoke, throw grenades at smell of garlic. Apparently the Chinese military at this point smelled like garlic. I have no idea why, but it was a thing. And after all 200 Marines had read the note, they all stood up, grabbed every grenade that they could find and began walking 500 yards out to where the smoke screen was. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. It's eerie. It's dead silent. The Marines aren't saying a word because they all know that this is probably going to be the end. They're calling for walking wounded to rejoin the fight. And that's never, ever a good thing. And they're making their way to the smoke screen. They finally get there and they take a few steps into the smoke and they just stand there and they wait and they wait 
and after 10 minutes there's a faint smell of garlic and it keeps getting stronger oh. and stronger and stronger and the marines know what's going to come next i'm willing to bet that all those marines no longer like to eat anything garlic related but they just don't know when to start throwing these grenades and then off in the distance in the smoke they hear a single cough and all the marines just begin throwing these grenades into the smoke screen within a matter of seconds they've completely exhausted their supply throwing over 500 grenades into the smoke and that was it there was nothing left to do but stand there and wait for the enemy to come and get them so that's what they did they stood there and they waited and they waited and the smell of garlic got a little bit fainter and a little bit fainter and finally the marines are like fuck it i'm going to bed so they walked back to the aid station went to bed woke up the next morning and holy shit the enemy artillery had completely stopped and the battle was over they would later find out that the chinese suffered over 4,000 casualties trying to break through the marine line Ooh. and after the incident at 11 o'clock at night with the smoke screen in the aid station they simply could not afford to lose any more men and were forced to retreat so that was it the marines did it against all odds somehow the marines managed to hold the line against a vastly superior force larger larger force not <laughs> superior force very important detail preventing the enemy from retaking seoul giving nato the political leverage they needed to negotiate peace talks so in other words the marines made sure that seoul still had its soul Put down your tomatoes. That was a funny joke. It was a funny joke. And establishing and preserving the South Korea that we know today. And arguably, it's all because of a single horse that absolutely refused to give up on her fellow Marines. And because of this, Reckless is declared the hero of Outpost Vegas, and she is awarded the rank of Corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Shortly after the battle, the Marines get rotated out by a brigade from the Turkish military, and the Marines finally get some much-deserved R&R. After that, the war's really starting to wind down, so the Marines are going to pack up all their shit. They're going to board a Navy LST, which is basically an amphibious landing ship that ship's going to take them all the way to Incheon and then from there they're just going to kind of hang out for a while and wait for the peace treaty to get signed but since they're boarding a navy vessel they have to come up with a manifest of all the supplies how many guys they got all the equipment how much everything weighs and yada, 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 yada. on the manifest they write down one horse reckless corporal type the manifest makes its way to the captain of the lst he's supposed to sign off on everything he sees horse and he's like what the fuck? The Marines are probably just messing with me. They're not actually bringing a horse on my ship. It's probably just like a pallet of beer and they wanted to let me know to account for the weight. It's fine. He signs off on the manifest, sends it back. It's all good. Fast forward a couple of weeks, the Marines start loading all their stuff up on the boat. Then they go to bring Corporal Reckless up. And Marines don't lie, cheat, or steal. And when we say we're bringing a horse, God damn it, you better believe it. Okay? That goes for everything. Everything. Okay? When we say we're bringing something, we're bringing something. How, how dare anyone say, oh, they're just messing around. We, we are merry gentlemen. We don't swear. <laughs> we, we don't get in reckless fights. None of that. How dare anyone. <laughs> ah. Semper Fi, Dallas onto the ship and the captain is like whoa 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 absolutely not you're not bringing a horse on my ship i've had the cleanest ship in the navy for two years running and this horse is going to ruin that to which the marines are like bro you signed the manifest signed it. yeah exactly this is happening get over it one thing leads to another corporal reckless gets on that ship absolutely. once they get reckless all the equipment and all the marines on board the ship takes off and all the navy members are kind of making fun of reckless and the marines because it's not normal for marines to care this much about an animal and they're not treating reckless with the respect that she deserves yeah so when they demand that reckless gets fed bacon eggs and beer just like the marines the navy absolutely refuses and they said they're only going to give her cabbage and wheat so that's what they do this upsets reckless's stomach and she proceeds to shit all over this boat for the next three days a couple days later, Reckless starts feeling better. They're almost to Inchon. They're about to port, get off this boat. Everything's going to be great. At this point, the Marine Corps officers have a brilliant idea. They decide, hey, us and our men just went through one of the bloodiest battles in American military history. Yeah. The horse has been sick this entire time. You know what would make everybody a lot happier? If instead of just parking the fucking boat and getting off like normal people, what if we did an amphibious landing? You know, for fun and training and stuff yeah yeah what, what could possibly go wrong now however it is officers coming up with this idea just, just remember just remember the officers think they're in charge of the marine corps the marine corps is run by the enlisted okay okay 
it's just, it's just a fact. Other branches can have their officers and they run their little show. Enlisted run the show in the Marine Corps, okay? Officers are just there just to look shiny. That's it. That's it. That's the only only reason. Stuff. Wouldn't that be great? To which all the enlisted men are like, fucking fine, whatever. Let's just do it and get it over with. So they make an amphibious landing in Inchon for training, but guess what? Reckless doesn't understand that it's for training. She thinks this shit's for real. So Reckless becomes the only horse in Marine Corps history to successfully make an amphibious landing. So the Marines get settled down in Inchon and that's when they notice that there's a horse all over the news. It's in every newspaper, it's in every magazine, yes. it's on every radio broadcast. The entire world is talking about this horse, but it's yeah. not Corporal Reckless. It's some horse over in America called Native Dancer. It's the greatest horse in the world. It's going to win the Kentucky Derby, blah, blah, blah. And the Marines are kind of getting pissed because they know for a fact that they have the best horse in the world. Yeah, exactly. First of all, Native Dancer. I'm, I'm getting offended. I'm getting offended that the newspapers are saying that was a better horse. Uh, Corporal, soon to be Sergeant Reckless, is the best and it's Corporal Reckless, not Native Dancer. And the Marines are willing to put their money where their mouth is because they pool together over $25,000, which is like over a quarter million dollars in today's money. And they publicly offer it up as a wager to the owner of Native Dancer. Hey, bring your horse over to South Korea, beat Reckless in a race, and you can have the money. But this wasn't just going to be any race. This was going to be called the Paddy Derby. It was a yes. mile and a half course uphill through rice paddies, and each horse wasn't going to have a rider, and they were going to have to carry 192 pounds of ammunition. That's Unfortunately right. for everybody, Native Dancer's owner decided that they were not going to partake in this competition. So now Ooh. the Marines kind of just hung out until the end of the war. Then the order comes down. Hey, pack your shit. It's time to go home. The Marines are like, cool, great, grand, wonderful. How are we going to get Reckless home? At which point the leadership over at the Marine Corps is like, well, here's the thing. We don't think that the taxpayers would appreciate spending their money to transport this horse all the way back to America. So uh, we're just going to abandon her here. To which... The I'm going to let you all in on an old school joke. I might be butchering here and there because I'm getting old and senile and my brain doesn't work the way it used to work anymore. There is a Navy Admiral, an Air Force General, an Army General, and a Marine Corps Commandant, which is a general too, right? And each one is bragging how strong their branch of service is. The Admiral of the Navy says, you want to see what bravery is? Sailor. Run some random sailor walking around. Go stand in front of that train. Sailor stands in front of the train. Train runs him over, right? Air Force General says, Hey, you want to see bravery? Airmen, stand in front of that train. Train comes in and runs over, right? Because, you know, airmen and the sailor just listen. The Army General says, No, mine are braver. Soldiers, there's some random soldier walking around. Stand in front of that train. Train also runs over that poor soldier. Marine Corps says, hey, the Marine Corps Commandant, the General, says, no. You want to see what real bravery is? Private. Some random Marine just walking down the street. Stand in front of the train. The Marine, private, and listen, man, turns around, looks the Commandant in the eye and says, F you, sir. Gives him the bird, walks off into the sunset. Now that's bravery right there. Because Sergeant Major is probably going to rip off that private's head. But nonetheless, that's bravery right there. And you don't tell the Marines what to do, okay? When you say you're not going to bring the horse back to America, uh-uh, we leave no man behind. How dare you? How simply dare you? The taxpayer will like it. The beatings will continue until morale improves. The entire Marine Corps is like, the fuck you are. They go into yeah. full Shamurai mode. They're going to figure out how to get Corporal Reckless back to America through the back channels, whatever it takes. So they end up getting a hold of a public company called Pacific Transport, and they convince the owner to take Reckless all the way back to America. The only problem is Pacific Transport doesn't go to South Korea. The closest he can get is to Japan. Okay, cool. Now we just have to get Reckless from to South Korea, Korea to, to Japan. Japan. Reckless's platoon then gets a hold of the Marine Corps air wing and 
and they convince those Marines to let them smuggle Reckless onto a cargo plane, Brilliant. going from South Korea to Japan. From there, they get Reckless onto the Pacific Transport ship. They Go take ahead. them all the way back to San Francisco, yes. where the Marines are going to re-meet back up with Reckless. Okay, fast forward. The Marines make it to San Francisco. The Pacific Transport ship makes it to San Francisco. The Marines go there to pick up Reckless, at which point they find out that Customs beat them there and Customs called the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Agriculture said, mm, uh, Of all the institutions, the Department of Agriculture, the greatest opponents of the Marine Corps ever. <laughs> going to have this horse destroyed because she could have diseases. The Marines then explained to this guy from the Department of Agriculture, look, no. this is a war hero. You're not killing this horse. She's coming with us. At which point the Department of Agriculture guy is like, oh no, she's staying here and we're going to have her destroyed. Now the Marines are kind of looking around at each other. They're looking at this pencil pusher from the Department of Agriculture and the Marines without saying a word have just communicated with their eyes. We're actually going to have to kill this guy and hide the body. Department cool. of Agriculture Great. guy is finally starting to piece together how quickly and how far this might escalate. And he finally comes to his senses and he's like, okay, look, maybe Brilliant. just maybe I'll take a blood sample. I'll take it to the lab. And if she doesn't have any diseases, we'll release her to which the Marines are like, that's a solid call. So the guy takes the blood sample, says it'll take me about a week to get the results. Go ahead and just leave the horse here. You guys can head out at which the Marines said, nah, we're going to stay with the horse. That's right. And the agriculture guy is like, that's not necessary. And the Marines are like, oh, no, we're staying. Yeah, it is. Because at this point, the Marines have come to the conclusion that the communists were trying to kill Reckless for food and American bureaucracy is trying to kill Reckless just for fun and they cannot let her out of their sight no. ever again. So no. agriculture guy gets a blood sample. He leaves. The Marines hang out with the horse for a little while and then they're like, oh, hey. There's a Marine Corps ball tonight. Reckless is a Marine. Let's go. Then they smuggled Reckless out of the ship. Then they... Marine Corps birthday, November 10th, 1775. <sighs> smuggled her out of the port. Then somehow they got her all the way across San Francisco into the building, up the freight elevator, and they made it to the Marine Corps ball. Reckless walks in and she has just given every Marine in that room the excuse they were looking for to get absolutely hammered. Everybody's drinking beer, eating cake, including Corporal Reckless, and Reckless is also eating all the flower decorations. It's a great time. Everybody great. wakes up. Great, man. It's one hell of a party. The next morning, super hungover. They all go out. They get breakfast, bacon, eggs, give some to Reckless. Now, here's the problem. They kind of have smuggled this horse out and they don't know what to do with it. They also can't let the government find out where the horse is because the government is actively trying to destroy her for no reason. Then once Reckless gets to Camp Pendleton, the American public finds out that Reckless made it home and everybody's super pumped. They want to know all about it. The news is getting involved. America's celebrating because... And no smartphone in sight, yet somehow word got out because people don't know how to keep their mouths closed. It's not like, you know, a big deal, a horse at a Marine Corps ball, but oh no, people got to talk. No snitching. Fucking America's war horse made it home. This is awesome. At which point the high ranking Marine officers that were going to abandon her are like, holy shit. Wow. What a great idea. You guys smuggled her all the way here and uh, we're just going to take credit for it because this is going no offense to any of our viewing members who are probably Marine Corps officers or family members to Marine Corps officers, but we let you run the show just because, okay? Not taking credit for the enlisted, okay? The enlisted let you run the show. Just remember, if you want to be all sparkly and shiny in leadership, you should have joined the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, okay? Marine Corps as a whole has a different animal. This isn't the first time the brass, the shiny brass thought they had a big brain idea really well for us. We had no idea that the American public would be okay with us doing the right thing and bringing a war hero home. We thought the American public wanted us spending millions and billions of dollars teaching fucking pigeons how to drive missiles and strapping napalm bombs onto bats and shit. We had no idea that doing the right thing would be so popular. So then they throw a big parade. They have a big ceremony. Reckless gets promoted to E5 sergeant in the Marine Corps. They hook her up with this cool ass blanket. She gets awarded two purple hearts, one for each piece of shrapnel she took during the Battle of Outpost Vegas. It's a huge deal. She starts doing commercials, endorsements. The rule with that was she doesn't work for free. She's willing to do charity events for free. Anything else, if somebody wanted her to endorse a product, it had to be a product she actually liked. If it was food, it better be food she liked. If yep. it was a drink, it better be a drink that she liked drinking. Yep. Otherwise, she wasn't going to do it. Yep. And those companies had to pay $1,000 for the privilege of working with somebody. 
Sergeant Reckless, and Precisely. that money went to a charity for the Marine Corps. And here's yeah. the thing with Reckless being a sergeant. Most animals are like, oh, they're such and such rank, they're this rank, but they're not actually that rank. It's just like a symbolic thing. With Reckless, it was not a symbolic thing. The Marines treated her like she was truly and legitimately a sergeant in the Marine Corps. Nobody that was a lower rank than her was allowed to give her orders or tell her what to do, okay? If the privates were standing around eating food and stuff and Reckless wandered up and nudged one, that was an order to share some food and that Precisely. private needed to obey it. She was given her own private stable right outside the post commander's house and exactly. there was a standing order that she was never to carry anything heavier than her blanket ever again. Again. Sergeant Reckless even had an well assistant. Done. Every time they got a batch of new recruits, they would find out who the farm kid was, and he would be tasked with taking care of Sergeant Reckless. Now, part of taking care of Sergeant Reckless was taking her out for her daily exercise. Now, how do you exercise a horse if you can't ride a horse because there's a standing order that she can't carry anything heavier than her blanket? Mm -hmm. And even if she could, you wouldn't be allowed to ride her because she's a higher rank than you. Yes. I have no idea. Neither did the Marine Corps, so they told this private, Fucking figure it out. So this kid <laughs> just had to start running next to Reckless five miles a day, every day. And this pattern carried on. Every time a new kid came, he just started running five miles a day with Reckless. And it became a running joke. Jesus Christ, literally a running joke yeah. that whoever was taking care of Reckless was the most in shape Marine in the Marine Corps. After a little while, the PR started to die down, but the high ranking officers in the Marine Corps didn't want that to happen because having the Marine Corps in the headlines all the time was really good. Yeah, so exactly. they concocted a plan to stay in the headlines even longer. Oh, they were no. gonna get some badass thoroughbred Kentucky Derby winning racehorse in here to have a kid with Sergeant Reckless. So that's exactly what they do. They find the thoroughbred horse they're gonna breed her with. They hire this PR firm, getting ready for all the news and publicity and blah, blah, blah. And then in true military fashion, the officers then proceed to not tell anybody that they fucking should. You know, like the private that's in charge of taking care of Sergeant Reckless. So from his perspective, one day he gets an order seemingly for no fucking reason to take Sergeant Reckless over to the normal horse stables, which never ever happens and stick her into an empty pen. So that's what he does. And he's like, okay, cool. I'm going to like go get lunch now or take a shit or whatever. So he leaves for a minute and one of the other Marines comes by and then sticks just your normal garden variety Marine bucking horse in the same pen as oh, Reckless, no. not knowing it was Reckless because Reckless is never in those pens anyways. So fast forward a little bit. Sergeant Reckless's assistant comes back and Reckless and this bucking horse are midway through a horizontal jogging session and he's not about to get in there and stop it. Okay, now Sergeant Reckless's assistant is having a full on panic attack attack because Sergeant Reckless, the pride of the Marine Corps, is currently getting taken to Pound Town on his watch and he is definitely going to be in trouble for it. So as soon as they finish, he runs in, gets Reckless, takes her in the barn. He's brushing out her mane. He's getting the scratches off of her sides. He's trying to hide all the evidence. And then while they're in the barn taking care of that, that other bucking horse gets taken out of the pen and this big old fancy truck pulls up with this big old fancy trailer and this big ass Kentucky Derby winning thoroughbred race horse gets unloaded and put in the pen that Reckless was just in. He gets done cleaning Reckless up in the barn, takes her out and everybody's like, bro, what are you doing? Reckless is supposed to be in there with this other horse get him in there. So then all those guys leave to get lunch or do whatever. And Sergeant Reckless's assistant is like, okay, there's no way I'm leaving. I'm not going to have this happen again. I'm going to stay here the entire time and make sure there's no hanky panky. There'll be no riding the baloney pony around here ever again. I got to make sure this does not happen. So he sits there and cock blocks his thoroughbred the entire time. So as far as he's concerned, mission accomplished. Nobody ever needs to know that Reckless got deflowered on his watch. It's going to be fine. Then fast forward 28 days later, he shows up at Reckless's stable first thing in the morning to take care of her. And there's a bunch of high ranking military officers and a bunch of news crews right outside the stable. He rolls up like, what's, uh, what's going on? And the general is like, Reckless is pregnant. And he's like, oh, oh okay. okay. Is that, that's a good thing. And they're like, yeah, no, that's great. That's a terrific thing. At this point, the news crews have kind of put together that this is a kid in charge of taking care of Sergeant Reckless. So one of them yells out, hey, what's the name of that thoroughbred racehorse that she's having the baby with again? At which point he just responds like, what are you talking about? I don't know its name. It was just one of the random Marine bucking horses we had in the pen. Record scratch, dead silence, pure confusion. The general grabs this private yanks him around the corner of the stable. It's like, what the fuck did you just say? So he explains to the general everything that happened. And the general is like, you idiot. Reckless was supposed to sleep with that big ass thoroughbred racehorse. To which he's like, well, somebody should have told me that. I don't know what to tell you. So now the plan is officially ruined. The news. 
hey man, if you don't if you don't send down the order, how are we supposed to know? Goofy officers. His crews leave and the PR firm has to figure out how to piece this thing back together. And the plan they come up with is to get a big ass sign and put it up on the hill by Camp Pendleton. And the sign simply says, it's a dot, dot, dot. Yeah, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down in the plot twists that absolutely nobody saw coming, the United States Marine Corps is actually responsible for inventing gender reveals. And that's how they still managed to generate a bunch of hype for Sergeant Reckless's kid, getting the entire world to speculate as to whether or not it was gonna be a boy or a girl. The pregnancy goes great. She goes on to give birth to a cult, AKA a boy. They go out, write boy in big blue letters on their sign. And then the Marines throw a big ass party because they're amped, unwittingly throwing the world's first ever gender reveal party, which I'm gonna hold against the Marine Corps forever. Ever. But now, hey, we're 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 breaking new ground. Uh, how 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 <clears throat> how dare you? How dare you? Now everybody wants to know what are we going to name this young colt? So the high-ranking marine officers step in again, and they're like, "I have another great PR idea. Let's have a competition where all the marines can submit their ideas for names. We'll pick the best one, and that guy can win a week of leave." Brilliant idea. So that's exactly what they do. Hundreds of Marines send in their ideas for names. The front runners were like Semper Fi, Freedom, Liberty, pretty generic stuff, but that's what you have to do when you have a big public figure like Sergeant Reckless and her new baby. But the commanding officer in charge is just like, I don't like any of these names. I'm gonna name it myself. So uh. he just decides that he's gonna pick a random private and be like, hey, you're you're the winner, even though you didn't pick the name, but I'm just gonna say you're the winner so I don't look like an asshole. And then he named the cult Fearless, which that's a great name. I'm just getting really, really jaded with bureaucrats and high ranking officers in this video for yes. some reason. Sorry about that. Anyways, fast forward a couple years, 1959, Sergeant Reckless is now getting promoted to Staff Sergeant Reckless. Congratulations. E6. There's a 1700 man parade, a 19 gun salute. The Marines make a huge deal out of it because well, Reckless deserves it. So that's what they do. And in the crowd that day was none other than the new private fearless of the United States Marine Corps, which I thought was pretty cool. Later that year, she would give birth to another boy named Dauntless. And then a couple years after that, she would give birth to yet another boy named Chesty, named after Chesty Puller, the most- That's right, Chesty Puller. Well done, Chesty. Decorated Marine of all time. And as rumor has it, the last Marine to ever ride Reckless. From there, Sergeant Reckless would retire and spend the rest of her life living on Camp Pendleton as the highly regarded, highly respected war hero that she was before passing away in 1968. So in conclusion, this has been the story of Sergeant Reckless, the hero of Outpost Vegas, America's greatest war horse, the four-legged Marine that fought during the Korean War, which is commonly referred to as the Forgotten War. But as is the case with most of us, it's not that we forgot it, it's that we were never taught about it in the first place. So True. if you made it this far in the video, I really hope that you learned something. If you wanted to support the channel, best way to do that is go check out thefatelectrician.com. We got merch, I got a Patreon with deleted True. scenes. Otherwise, until next time, quack bang, out. I think we learned something here today. First of all, Marines, once again, we do that home run homer. And here's the thing. We, we, have, we have to remember. We have to remember always. Huge shout out to the fat electrician who keeps on kicking ass and taking names. You know, it is what it is. But also, 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 folks, let's also remember something else here, too, about Sergeant Reckless. Marines never give up. Marines, Marines always keep their uh, heads on a swivel keep on winning um but this was a fun video so if you haven't already please subscribe and support the original content creator the bad electrician uh marines always get it done m-a-r-i-n-e-s that's the way you spell success never give up never surrender never leave a person behind and listen when the marines want to get something done we get it done always we get it done this isn't open for a debate semper fidelis